Good morning to all of you. It's, uh, it is always a delight to gather publicly with each other for worship. Um, I know a lot of people are being affected by COVID concerns and we have people missing. Uh, hopefully I can extend a welcome to any of those uh, individuals who are watching uh, the recorded version of this service. I want to welcome anybody who may be a, minister, uh, a visitor to us. I, I hope that you have a meaningful time here. Um, uh, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So with that, we begin. Uh, let me uh, offer one or two little things real quickly. Uh, well, let's all welcome Judy back. Um, you, you want to put your foot up on there so we can see and pray over Yay! <laughs> Um, there will be some, uh, some additional announcements. I do want to call attention to something that I'm doing if, if you uh, enjoy art. I am doing a little series on Madonna with child. Madonna's Italian for my mother uh, and child. That's the, uh, Madonna with child is the most painted uh, Christian image in all of human history. And I'm just trying to offer up a perspective from a global uh, view. So the notes about the pieces of art uh, that I'm putting on there are um, in the back of the bulletin under citations. So I don't know who else is doing. Dan's doing the announcements. Okay. Well, you stole a little bit of my thunder about welcoming Judy, but that's okay. We are so glad she's back that I guess we can say it more than once. Ah. Morning. First of all, Eric Kinsler is magnificent. He is just coming along like gangbusters. Um, I hope we get to see him soon. I have no idea when, but you are going to be amazed. Absolutely amazed. So keep those cards and letters and texts going into him, because believe me, every one of those gives him another little pump, because he's doing things they never imagined he'd be doing this soon. He is just really going. He's quite a guy. Uh, I want you to take note, we are now putting the announcements in the bulletin. Take note of them. We're not going to go through every one of them because they're there for you to read. There's information that you may need. And keep this bulletin and look at it throughout the week. Remind yourself what's coming up, what's going to happen, what do I need to know about so that you don't miss something. So it's very important that you keep these close at hand. A reminder once again that Ed Tobia's class will not be in session today. Ed will be back and resume next week, next Sunday, okay, on the 22nd. <clears throat> Special things. It is about to be the 64th anniversary of the wedding of Diana Hill and, what's his name, Bob, Bob, that's it, and Bob Hill. And Bob Hill is here this morning. And I just think that's wonderful. 64 years through thick and thin. And our list, Miles wanted us to know that Irene Fillion's 91st birthday is coming up. And evidently her WPC mob group wants you to know too, and I have no idea what that is. So, okay. So lots of things in the bulletin to keep looking for. Okay, right now, let's see. Oh, yeah. We're going to tell you this several times so that we don't forget, and there's no confusion. After the postlude, the ushers will start at the back of the sanctuary, releasing each pew or section of pews to leave, go outside, meet the pastors outdoors, meet your friends outdoors, take your masks off in your own little groups out there if you like. That way we don't clog up everything in here. When we started down here, it just kind of clogged up. That's one of the things we don't want to do because of COVID. We don't want masses of people clogged up. So try to remember, after the postlude, wait for the ushers, and they'll let you go. And, and if we do that, it'll go real fast. It'll go really, really fast. Uh, let's see. Okay, the last thing I have is a mission for mission, minute for mission from Kathy Black. Good morning, everyone. A sweet friendship refreshes a soul. This is from Proverbs 27, 9. I'm here today to share a wonderful program for the ladies of WPC called Sisters in Faith. 
Each lady should have received an invitation letter and a green commitment card through the mail. Sisters in Faith provides an awesome opportunity for the women of WPC to connect with one another to form new friendships and strengthen existing ones. You will be matched with another WPC sister and have the opportunity to nurture an individual friendship and as well through the larger group attend monthly gatherings. We have a great time. Especially during these challenging times, it is great to have the extra love and support of a caring friend. This program was established here approximately 15 years ago. My sisters over the years have been solid friendships for life and have meant so much to me. Our Helen Dillion, an avid supporter of this program, will be our guest speaker at the kickoff luncheon, and that is Sunday, September the 26th. Commitment cards need to be returned by Sunday, August the 29th. If you need a card, please look for myself, Margaret Harris, or Evelyn Timmons after the service. Again, a sweet friendship refreshes a soul, Proverbs 27, 9. I'm looking forward to growing our sisterhood. Thank you. Please join me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord. We will give thanks to the Lord with our whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. Please pray with me. O oh, fear the Lord, you his holy ones, for those whose fear him have no want. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Which of you desires life and covets many days to enjoy good? Keep your tongue from evil and let your lips keep from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. We ask these through our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our poem for today is Which Way by Jeff Norberg. Standing on the crossroads, deciding which way to go toward, to the left is my way, and to the right is to the Lord. My way means humans who are just as imperfect as me. The Lord's way means perfection will walk beside me and be a friend in need. My way is like a boat that doesn't have an oar. The Lord's way is like an eagle that was meant to soar. It is true that with my way, a false sense of freedom could seem strong, whereas the Lord's way might take work and the road may seem long. Eventually, though, the illusion of freedom would end and I would be destitute and all alone. But the Lord's way means I would have a friend to take my hand and lead me home. I noticed that even with all my possessions, my life would always get unfurled. So I reached for the treasures of heaven and not those of this world. I know I made the right choice as I turned right onto the road. For it was at that instant I felt the Lord take my hand and release my load. Our opening hymn this morning is number 396, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4, sort of. The choir and the band are going to do the, uh, the first verse, and then I'm going to ask you to join in on 2 and 4. Let's just go ahead and all stand right now.
As Christians, we are called to confess our sins. In a world with much evil, God continues to work for good. In a culture which worships foolishness, God still offers wisdom as a gift. In a time filled with lies, God's promises are true. In a society obsessed with reality, God's love is constant. Let us come to the one who offers the bread of life, the promise of redemption, and the grace of forgiveness. Please join me as we pray. You must shake your head in wonder at our ways, keeper of the covenant. How can we say we want wisdom when we foolishly squander the knowledge we have of your ways? How can we claim to follow you when we walk the slippery roads of the world, not caring where they lead us? How can we desire your great and steadfast love when the simple seductions of our society are in full view every day? How can you have mercy on such an unwise and unfaithful people, perfect wisdom? Yet, that is exactly what you do, and our greed turns to gratitude, our pettiness to praise, our tantrums to thanksgiving, as hope and joy become our blessing through the one we call our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God sent redemption for all. In Christ, God feeds our hungry souls. In Christ, God gives the cup of salvation to thirsty people. We give thanks to God for everything, forgiveness, hope, new life. Amen. time when we pass the peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. And now Miss Julie will have time with children. Hi everybody. So there are two things that I'm pretty sure everybody at WPC knows about me because I talk about it a lot. I'm a teacher and I'm a mom. And this year, the teacher and the mom 
are coming together at my school because my littlest boy, Jackson, is starting kindergarten. And we are very excited at my house. And I am very excited at school. And this year may have been the very first year as a teacher that I have had my room ready to roll as early as I did. Everything exactly where it's supposed to be. Everything is ready. My, my music stand is set up at the front of the music room. My lesson plans are out. I am ready to roll. And it's because I wanted to make sure teacher me was ready so that mom me could be everything I needed to be. Well, mom me has got it together this year too. And Jackson's backpack is already packed and ready for Monday morning. Everything is put together. We've gotten the groceries, we've gotten the snacks. We are ready. I am so ready for this year. And then something happened to me last night while I was sleeping. Two words, two tiny little silly words. Two words that when you're in kindergarten are so simple that they're on your sight word list. And they changed my entire brain. What if? <laughs> what if things don't go the way they're supposed to? What if Jackson gets in his classroom and he's worried? What if? I don't have any friends in my class. What if we go out to recess and I fall off the monkey bars and break my arm on the first day? What if, boy, it can just start to get bigger and bigger and bigger and pretty soon all of the excitement is gone because worry has taken over. So last night, it was all the mom worries, and it was all the teacher worries, and it was all the grown-up worries that we're having right now for our children going back to school. And kids are having their worries too. They're having their what-ifs. And I try to do my best to remember what I always tell my kiddos here at WPC. I need to turn to God and I need to say a prayer. And so I did. And all my worries, I tried to give to God. And what if kept coming back and whispering, but what if? Oh, you forgot this one. What if? And finally, I heard myself. I thought it was myself. But I heard the word stop. Because... What if doesn't have to be a terrible combination of words? What if everything goes exactly right? What if you walk into school on Monday morning and everybody is so excited to see each other and everybody is doing exactly what they need to do to show that we love each other and we're taking care of each other? What if all of the wonderful things are beyond our imagination? And that's exactly what God wants us to be thinking. Because God is a God of miracles. God is in the business of what if. But not the bad what if, not the doubtful what if. He's in the business of miraculous and wonderful what ifs. So tonight, to all of my kiddos who are watching online, when you start to hear those what ifs, I want you to help God say, stop. And I want you to listen to God's what ifs, because God's what ifs are the wonderful what ifs. And they're all of the wonderful possibilities of the things that this great school year can bring us. And I think that if we start listening to God's what ifs more than the what ifs of this world, we're gonna find that we can all walk through our days a little bit lighter and a whole lot happier and feeling much, much better about where we're headed. So let's say a prayer. 
Dear God, thank you for filling us with wonderful what ifs. Help us to say stop when the doubtful what ifs creep in. Amen. Sonia, it was wonderful having you sign for us this morning. It's always nice to see you here. Thank you. And Junie, it is rumored, in, Julie, it's rumored in my house, I don't know who, but there is a what if person in my family. So thank you for that. I will try to get that person to remember. Please, everybody, still all the thoughts that are distracting you this morning, center yourselves, direct your hearts and minds as we go to God who listens to our prayers, answers our prayers, perhaps in ways we don't understand or know. But let us pray this day. Join me, please. Yahweh, our world is in turmoil. Some days we hardly recognize your creation and the children you love. What has happened to us? There seems to be one crisis after another with very little time for recuperation, if at all. Your people cry out in pain and anguish, powerlessness, anger and frustration. Where are you, O oh God? Our planet is literally on fire. COVID-19 variants are rampant and more aggressive than was known. Civil discourse is out the window. Politics seems to be what can I do for me and mine? Do you care about us, dear God? Of course you do, Lord. How soon we forget which is why we come to you in prayer. When King David was confronted with his greatest sin, he reached out and said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing, but now I pray you, take away the guilt from your servant, for I have done foolishly. And you did, forgiving sovereign. Neither you, gracious God, nor Jesus ever told us life would be easy. Even more, Jesus said following the way might be harder. Prick our consciences, minds, and hearts that we recognize how we might be part of the problem. Build up our faith in you that we have eyes to see that any stumbling block before us can be a call to action. Help us get off our blessed assurances, Lord, and get moving. Goad us into being part of the solution. Help us, Sovereign Lord, to help our leaders do justice, love mercy, that our national policies be neither heartless nor brainless. Offer us, we pray, enlightenment to our own issues of poverty, injustice, merciless, etc., that we may vocalize our feelings with honor and respect. Dear God, Paul wrote to the Philippians, do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. God of the entire planet, we lift up to you the people of Haiti, whose multiple hundreds of wounded be cared for, and with your love and grace be healed. For the hundreds who have died, those still missing, Bless and comfort the grief in the hearts of their families and loved ones. Surround them with your peace during this time of bewilderment, anger, fear, and great pain. For the citizens in countries at war within their own borders and from outside hostile forces, how they too must wonder why have they been ignored and abandoned your people Israel felt those emotions as well. The writer of 1 Kings told the Israelites through King Solomon, the Lord our God be with us 
as he was with our ancestors, may he not leave us or abandon us. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob prevail and bring justice and reconciliation to the world. Preeminent God, please listen and embrace the thoughts and prayers that reside in our hearts and minds about those whom we love and care for in our family and friends. Lord, we take a moment silently to lift these to you. Lord, in your divine mercy, hear our prayers. Now, more than ever, we pray the prayer Christ Jesus taught his disciples and us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let me just say a word before I pray about what went on in my head to think about what to say today. Um, the mainline church, which Webster belongs to, uh, which one once in the past was filled with uh, millions and millions of people, has been in decline, they say, uh, since 1962. Uh, this year was the first year, or last year was the first year that there was rec recorded growth among all of the mainline churches. Um, it's I've been pondering uh, as I meet more and more nuns, N-O-N-E-S, uh, where they will find uh, communities of character formation, communities of character, within the religious tradition. Uh, the home uh, is the place where character first is formed, and the church is, is, is a community of care, character formation. And if the communities of character formation continue to decline, and you see, as it's clear in the world, a overall decline in morality in the United States, um, how do you restore um, character, character formation? And uh, that's the backdrop. Um, the church has always been a community of character formation. It's within the confines of a church, we begin to learn how to behave as we grow up. Just be pondering, what happens if there is no powerful community of character formation in the world? Not that the church is the only one, but the first text is from uh, Ephesians, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll read that in a minute, but it's Ephesians uh, verse 15 through 20. You'll see this is an illustration of what a community of character looks for. Before I read it, let us pray. O oh, wise God, bring wisdom to the many to help us know how to live afresh with deep commitment within communities of character. Help us know how to provide a witness of what it means to live together in love with justice in our land. We pray that we can provide that witness as we ponder a little bit more deeply what it is that churches do when people gather to be formed with a certain kind of character, the character of Jesus. We ask for much wisdom, for much, 
formation of character is in deep need here in the United States. So hear our prayer and illumine us, if you will. We pray in the holy name of Jesus and all the people together say, Amen. Now all of you know, if you've read your Bible, that the churches that Paul worked with uh, all had conflicts. And um, whopper conflicts. And of course what was happening is Paul had brought Jews and Gentiles together under one community formed by Christ. Well, the Gentiles brought the way they had been formed. The Jews brought the way they had been formed. And now they're being formed afresh through their understanding of what it meant to imitate Jesus. And he sometimes fusses or sometimes then gives riffs on the elements that are critical to forming character. And you hear it echoed in these verses from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. This is speaking to a congregation. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit of God as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to the God, God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. second lesson today also is uh, about, from Pauline literature. It's about the church in uh, Colossae, and it is another church with conflict. And here, uh, 
Paul is speaking again into uh, the elements of what a faith community does in terms of character formation, beginning with verse 12 and reading through verse 17 of uh, chapter 3 of Colossians. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves, this is speaking to a group, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of God, of the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your heart, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was in the fall of 1980. It was my very first class at Duke Divinity School. The professor's name was John Westerhoff, and he taught Christian education. He was an Episcopalian um, who was very thoughtful about the word formation, and he uh, had us read a book that he had just published, Will Our Children Have Faith? Now, he went on to say a sentence that has stuck with me forever, and I think it's worth you putting into your own memory. Faith is caught, not taught. Faith is caught, not taught. Now, I was in seminary the first class, and I had come to be taught so I could do what I do now. I didn't even know what he meant by caught at first glance. But then again, begin to, to share what happens to people who live in a faith community all their lives and what also happens in families. We do catch uh, a lot of our moral commitments by the way people act morally in our homes. We catch how to speak by seeing the way our parents speak to each other. We catch the importance and significance of rituals by the way we observe our parents uh, making uh, significant days very important. Baptisms and weddings, the holidays. And he got me thinking about my own formation. I've mentioned before my mom with her, uh, hmm, get back to me on that, which led me to understand that part of being faithful is to think deeply about things. My deepest and most significant religious memory was the act of walking to a communion rail and kneeling and having uh, a priest or a minister come by and share the elements of the Lord's Supper. It's still the most meaningful way for me for communion. And then I remember in high school, uh, Mary Helen's dad, who's a Presbyterian minister, agreed to help start Young Life in our community. So the first Young Life meeting was with her home, and all of our friends came, and there were guitars and songs and skits and a little sermon at the end. And much to the surprise of my parents, the second Young Life meeting occurred in my parents' home, where people descended and did the same thing. 
And then there was the invitation to be a youth advisor in the Presbyterian Church while I was in college. It was in all of what goes on when you participate in a faith community that I caught faith. And then, because I had fallen in love with faith, I'm reminded of the old term, we like to understand that which we love. The education came on top of what was caught. Churches are the same way. We do take for granted often the realities of what we do here. We are formed by public worship over time. John Calvin used to say about preaching, and it's helped me because I've got qualms about preaching. Preaching forms a godly public opinion over time. So if you preach about compassion for the needy in a church over 40 years, the congregation's gradually going to figure out how to do compassion for the needy over many years. We're formed by the rituals of the holidays. We're formed by the importance of the significance of human lives when we gather for baptisms, when we gather for weddings, and when we gather for funerals. We are, are, are formed by voices that come from pulpits and Sunday school rooms about what morality looks like for someone who says they allow Jesus to be Lord. We gather and we are shaped by the music of the church and the arts of the church in ways we may not fully comprehend. You know, it's said of Alzheimer's patients that one of the last things to go is the memory of music. I remember being at the former choir director's house who was in the latter stages of Alzheimer's and the choir had come to do last rites with him. And it was like the very beginning of being in Greensboro and so we started singing hymns and out of the bed of a man who was near death, he began to sing with them, formed by music for so long. Then I got to thinking about John Westerhoff's book, Will Our Children Have Faith? And now Mary Helen and our grandparents. We might have three in the oven, by the way. Would make eight. And so will our children and grandchildren have faith really is a question. There are a lot of people in this room who have members of their faith who've drifted off, the family who've drifted off, or friends of yours who've drifted off, who see no use for the church. But I have one daughter who is struggling with the church. Actually, I have two daughters struggling with the church. Let me say Mary Helen and I do. And I keep wondering if they wander off, what will be the community of character formation for their children? Where will they go to celebrate the rituals of life? Or will those rituals be denuded of the sacred? Where will they go to... Um, to celebrate the special days that provide meaning for time, such as Advent or Lent, or even the secular holidays like Thanksgiving? Where will they go to be with people their age, to sit under the teaching of some blessed Sunday school teacher where they talk of the things of Jesus and, and begin to take within themselves the heart of Jesus, where they know that the way to follow Jesus as an, a child and later as an adult is to forgive. And then they live in a community that is a community of forgiveness. What if that's not to be? Where will they have the opportunities to go on retreat and sing with a large group of people songs that point beyond themselves to something greater than who they are individually. 
where will they go? I want to put some thoughts in the minds of you who have family members who are drifting away to, to maybe have a conversation about character formation and where they see themselves and their grandchildren or children being formed. Is there a substitute? Well, one of my daughters says, yes, Dad, there are all kinds of communities. There's the exercise community. There is the uh, community at Starbucks. All kinds of communities, and that's true. But I don't really think there are too many institutions that do what religious communities do, formation. And so when we look at these texts from Paul, we see echoes of character formation as God's chosen ones. Well, there's the concept of call. I learned about call because I heard about call in the church, that we are called by Christ to imitate Christ, that's what you hear in a church. We're supposed to mimic or, or imitate all of the virtues of Jesus. What if you don't hear that and don't see it being embodied in the living community? We see a call to virtues. Clothe yourselves as groups, as families, as friends, as deep relationships with compassion and kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. What's so beautiful about virtues is they have no limit to the way they can grow. There is no exhaustion of compassion for the people of God. There's no exhaustion of kindness or humility or meekness or patience for communities of God. And where do children learn how to embody these virtues? They learn it at home first. But the church and other religious communities like us have always been the laboratories to practice and to refine the great virtues of what it means to be humane and to imitate God. Bear with one another and forgive one another are places of the church, we have commune confession every week. Why? To remind us of the way we've been forgiven and to remind us that we are to forgive lest there cannot really be a beloved community. And then we are told what the glue of life is. Love. Above all a community, clothe yourselves in love. Above all, a family, abide by the dictates of the one ethic that holds all things together. To maintain creative, redemptive, moral, endless goodwill towards all people. And then we're given the invitation to embody a practice, be thankful. Be thankful. We're told in a community like this that thanksgiving is a noble virtue. What if you never hear it? What if you never see it? We exist to provide that, that safety so people can learn all of that. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Thanks be God, we have a Lord named Jesus who in his own life embodied what God meant for human beings. We can see through the narratives of what we see what God looks like embodied in human form. We have somebody we can imitate. Where will people find such a master to guide them for how to live life? if they don't live in a community of character. And let the teachings, the wisdom that has been passed down through the Bible and all of the conversations about it go deep inside like water goes into a tea bag 
to help you mature and become a spiritual redwood with deep roots that help you when the storms of life come so you will not fall. Community of character, what I want to say is character like faith is caught first. And then because you love the way you've been raised, then you seek understanding for that which you already love. So for those of you who are struggling with why your children haven't followed in your steps or why you have family who are disappearing from the church, you need to listen to why. There's some good reasons. Part of it is that a lot of churches aren't being very faithful to the master. But one thing you can raise is where are you going to go for character formation? Who are you going to allow to be your teacher, to help shape the way you live? Where do you want to send your children or grandchildren that they might learn something about what it means to embody the Spirit of Christ? Can you really live well without being in a community? Will you get called, or where will you get called, to look after the poor and to seek justice and mercy for all? Where will you go but in a congregation like this where women will be treated like men because both are one in Christ? The question is simple. It's what John Westerhoff asked. Will our children have faith? And so I leave you to ponder, will your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren have faith? Well, what you could say is the likelihood that they will have faith and character goes way up if they're in a community such as this one. Let us pray. Lord, may all of us individually go away from here thinking about the way we were raised. Focusing not so much on the upsetting parts of our religious life, but focusing instead on the gifts that have come to us. People who showed us how to live and behave. Help us to ponder the role of our homes as laboratories of imitating Jesus and our faith communities as bigger laboratories where we come together in the messiness of life and the complexity of life to embody the great virtue of love. We pray for the well-being of those we hold dear. May they find their way to some group that surrounds them and forms them in the deep character of Jesus. We pray this for their well-being and for ours, all in the name of Jesus. And everyone says, amen. And as you are able, and join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father, who created all things. He knows me. I believe in Jesus Christ, who came to earth to demonstrate how to live according to God's purpose. He loves me. I believe in the Holy Spirit that empowers those who believe to live rightly and in community with others. It guides me and connects us. Through the crucifixion of Lord Jesus, my sins are forgiven. Through his resurrection, I am assured a place in the kingdom of God forever. Amen. Let's just be reminded part of the function of the church is we live in community so that we together can do all that God needs us to be and to become all that God needs us to become. So with that in mind, let us um, think about our stewardship. We'll continue to say thank you to this congregation for being such generous stewards by investing in the community so we can do what we can to honor God. It's an amazing gift that this congregation showers upon each other. Um, let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence in our lives. As we worship, we participate in the eternal banquet of Christ's presence. We celebrate God's provision and thank him for it. We thank you for the people gathered, the word preached, and the money given. It's all in your name, and all the people say, Amen. living bread that came down from heaven. Go nor knowing whatever is normal for you. God loves you. God is with you. <laughs> 